All right, hey everybody, Josh from Silka here, coming to you today from the quarantine uh, living room because the weather outside is not, uh, not the best. But uh, wanting to talk today about a topic we get asked about all the time, and that is the rule of 105. Now, I think uh, most of you probably heard of this. It gets thrown around a lot of articles, and it's the idea that the rim needs to be at least 105% the width uh, of the inflated tire. So rim, wider than tire. Um, you know, people often ask, like, is that, is it true? What, what are the extents, the limits? And so I want to take you, uh, I've got the computer here in front of me, I'm going to take you through sort of the history, how we came up with it, uh, where it comes from, and why that is sort of the minimum in my mind, um, if you want good high yaw performance. Now you'll see in here, let me go ahead and get my uh, screen record going. So we're gonna record the screen here uh, and we'll flip back and forth from it. But so the, the history here, this idea came to me, it was uh, 2002 and I was uh, here at the Texas A&M wind tunnel with this guy uh, who we all know as uh, Lance Armstrong and his people, uh, particularly Johan Bruniel was there and some of the Trek uh, development people and mechanics. And one of the things that I realized in the testing was that they were testing him uh, in this photo using a head three that had a 19 millimeter clincher tire. And over lunch, Johan was talking about how, uh, you know, he just wouldn't let the riders ride anything narrower than a 21. Um, that it was just too sketchy in the corners, too prone to flatting, needed to be run at too high a pressure. Um, and that really stuck with me. Wow, why are we testing these wheels in the tunnel in these conditions with tires we would never use? And also, why are we testing a clincher when he's running tubular? And so it kind of started me down this path of uh, trying to understand why this particular wheel, the, the three-spoke uh, wheel from head, didn't work with a tire wider than 20 millimeters and uh, really didn't work well with a tire wider than 19 millimeters. Um, and that really led us to the first uh, kind of what we call super toroidal rim shapes, uh, like this one. That's the uh, 808, inspired by that 2002 wind tunnel test, uh, and the rule of 105, which was I really came up with in the, the testing during the 808 development. Uh, we landed on the 808, which was 27.5 millimeters wide uh, in 2004 when we launched it. I mean, that was if you can take ourselves back, uh, what 16 years ago now. That was crazy wide. Um, uh, compared to anything that anybody had ever made, and yet that will really went on to change the world. Won a Tour Magazine milestone, uh, I mean, really probably became one of the most copied rim designs ever, and really ultimately was the basis for a lot of the, uh, the rims we have today, pretty much all of which are toroidal, uh, and pretty much all of which are quite a bit wider uh, than at least the tires of that era. So let's hop into our, uh, our CAD model here and I'll kind of show you the, the background story behind the Rule of 105. All right, so we're in the screen here and I have made a rim based on the sort of, one of the most famous rim pro, or uh, airfoil profiles ever, the, the NACA 0024. Uh, NACA uh, was really the precursor to NASA and in the teens and 20s, 19 teens and 100 teens and 20s, um, was tasked with developing uh, kind of a whole suite of airfoils for aircraft design and use. And the zero, zero, the series beginning zero, 00, the four digits, um, they are symmetric foils. They all have peak thickness at around 30% of cord length. Um, and in this instance, the uh, final two digits are actually the percentage of thickness. So 0024 is a 24% thick um, airfoil at 30% of cord length. So if it's 100 millimeters uh, cord length, 100 millimeters deep, it'd be 24 millimeters wide. Um, so I've got it here, and what I'm going to do, let's go ahead and flip it on its side and cut it and uh, zoom in on kind of what we're looking at. And you can see here, um, that's a 0024, right? This is a really fast low yaw. Uh, airfoil that has pretty good yaw stability up into the like the upper teens. You probably stall somewhere in the 20 degree range, maybe a little bit higher. 
um, very good low Reynolds number performance, uh, and you get really nice development of flow um, kind of up and around the front of the airfoil with that nice pointy uh, NACA airfoil trailing edge. Now, the, if you start to think about this in terms of a rim, uh, this would be an extremely fast rim because the leading edge here is just much skinnier than what you're going to find in the tire. And th this was one of the things that hit me as I, uh, you know, young me in the early 2000s grabbed all the aerodynamic textbooks and, you know, I frantically flipped through them looking for the page where the leading edge of the airfoil was a bicycle tire and I was really just crushed to learn that uh, nowhere in the aerospace world did they have airfoils with bicycle tire leading edges. Um, and so really you have to start with the tire. That is the thing that's actually, uh, you know, cutting the wind. Uh, the leading edge of our airfoil uh, is not the leading edge of a NACA airfoil. And so what happens uh, when you do that, you go in and let me turn this guy on. Oh my, there we go. When you scan an inflated bicycle tire, it looks like this. And uh, we can pretty much see here that that is nothing, really nothing. Uh, like our NACA rim profile. But you can begin to see kind of the, the merging, the coming together of the technologies. So from here, clearly we're gonna need a thicker airfoil. Um, and so we look at the 30, the 0030. Um, let's, let me turn him on. And so when I put a 30 in, I actually get at this point, this is a 23 millimeter GP4000 um, that is inflates to about 25 millimeters. So if I put that here with a 25 millimeter wide NACA 0030 profile, you can see we're not far off. We're just also not that close. So our NACA 30 rim has gotten us much closer than we were with the 24, but the problem that you'll see when we look at some CFD images here in a bit is that we are gonna separate uh, airflow right here off of this edge of the tire if we're lucky at low yaw, it might make it uh, a little bit past here and it's gone. Um, and so we really need something else. You look at how flow develops over this curve of the airfoil here. Um, you know, it's, it's gentle. So one of the keys to flow development uh, over an airfoil is the rate of change of curvature in the surface. And you, you can visualize this uh, with something called the curvature combs. And you can see this is pretty true of all airfoils, uh, the curvature combs uh, are, are ideally are the gentlest at the location where the separations are likely to occur. So like in this 30, it's awfully blunt at the leading edge. Um, and so they're a little bit more uh, extreme with the, the change in the combs. And then where the flow is going to begin to separate kind of up in here, they've actually gotten really gradual with that, uh, that change. It's the first derivative of curvature uh, when you talk about it in mathematical terms, um, you turn that off. You see when you do the look at a bicycle uh, wheel rim tire, um, the, the tire really, you just cannot get gentle enough rate of change of that curvature. You're going to separate. In our case, we're going to separate uh, right about here where we don't want to. So what you start doing is you start thinking about, uh, or I started thinking about, let's make, uh, what if we put ever bigger rim shape in there? And now all of a sudden, look at this. Look at how our, how relatively closely matched we are. Now, the 0030, that's a super blunt, that's really the bluntest of all the NACA profiles. Um, it's still not as blunt as a tire. Um, it's still got a little bit better rate of change of curvature there at the front, but all of a sudden, if I merge these two together uh, and I look at this difference, you know, if I kick the rim in here, I can actually get about 90, 85, 90% of this 0030 shape um, in what I have here. And so when you really look at it, we're at 25 here, we're 28 and a half uh, in the airfoil as it's drawn. And th this really was the beginning of my understanding and thinking that the rim just has to be wider than the tire if we want to maintain flow attachment. Uh, 
Probably the best example of this, uh, sadly, was not done by us uh, when I was at Zip, but was done by the marketing department at Trek uh, using their CFD. So if you, you guys look at the research, we actually developed with Matt Goto, uh, Intelligent Light and Star, uh, the world's most advanced bicycle CFD. It's really the one everybody still uses to this day. Uh, but the best marketing example of that, and really the best example of why the rim has to be wide, comes comes from uh, a Trek marketing piece on the D3 rim. We'll put it up here. And what you can see is in the, the traditional rim shape, uh, what you know we would call the NACA shape, um, that people use, essentially a V-shaped rim sitting behind the tire. The flow separates right off the tire, just like we talked about, uh, and it can never, um, it, it, it has no curvature in it to want to close up the wake, right? And you see as the, the rim is wider uh, than the tire. In this case, not all that much wider. It doesn't even quite meet the rule of 105, but just getting to about 103% in this example um, and having the curvature there at the, uh, in the leeward side behind the tire um, closes that gap up enough that you can get the flow to bend back down and dramatically reduce uh, the wake in the system there. So anyway, uh, I hope that helps clarify some of the background. Uh, in a future video, we'll get into some more details about stability. You know, this becomes important later when we start talking about stability of wheels that, you know, if I make this perfectly, as I've got it drawn here, perfectly uh, NACA 30 profiled rim, um, you know, it's beautiful flow attachment for, say, flow coming this way, but what happens, uh, what happens when, you know, this is the leading edge and the flow is on the back side of the wheel? You have dramatically different lift characteristics, uh, front half to back half, and because we're talking in this plane, um, the front to back half lift, uh, big difference and big changes in those numbers there uh, create yaw torque or steering torque. Uh, and that is the sketchiness of handling that you feel uh, when you're riding in sketchy winds or, or higher winds, variable winds. Um, and so that becomes a, an issue as well. You know, this, this could very well be, you know, as fast a wheel as we could possibly make. But if you leave it in the car uh, on, you know, the majority of days because you're scared to ride it, then it really isn't the fastest wheel for you. So there you have it, rule of 105 visualized uh, all the way back to the beginning, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.